committee meeting, and I would like to uh, pass the meeting over to Council Member Karen Stratton, who is the chair of Urban Experience. Council Member Stratton. Thanks, Madam Chair. And council members, if you can see my screen. Yes. Jake Lewin from City of Spokane Planning, uh, working on the downtown uh, Spokane downtown plan with the Downtown Spokane Partnership, who's uh, co-sponsoring this initiative with the city. And we've been coordinating together during this process with the plan, team, uh, plan consultant team at Framework. And I'm here to give a quick status update on Uh, and report on revisions the council may consider uh, later and uh, allow time for questions. And uh, the draft plan and related information is posted online at the uh, project website. The city plan commission recommended approval with modifications last month to the downtown plan. And in two weeks at a council meeting, we expect consideration of a resolution. This was discussed previously at the Council Study Session on June 3rd. The final public hearing and decision on the ordinance is expected uh, next month. So uh, the city, as a reminder, uh, the downtown plan area, the comprehensive plan provides for a growing and thriving downtown, designating it the regional center. It's uh, centered on the core of downtown, but also contains areas.
which was inserted into the project schedule, um, uh, occurred um, in, in the spring to present the draft plan. And in addition, there were visits to the community assembly, nearby neighborhood councils, and seven uh, plan commission workshops since the fall of 19, which were followed by the public hearing last month. And after the hearing, the plan commission recommended a modification to the plan to add two new action items that were not in the previous draft. So we'll take a look at those two new uh, action items that the plan commission recommended. Uh, first, the uh, plan commission or uh, public spaces 1.3 or PS 1.3 uh, relates to providing police services. This uh, it was inserted into the sections in the plan for public space strategies. And this would add to the city's draft plan, the new policy of a centralized downtown precinct. And uh, the remainder of the text here uh, really encourages the city to um, uh, offer up some officer visibility and outreach downtown. Uh, talks about community-oriented policing and neighborhood and community-oriented policing being a, uh, a value established in the city of, uh, city's comprehensive plan. Um, and then the plan commission was told these would be, these actions would be routed to departments for review. So I wanted to uh, quickly go over some city input that we've received initially for this first action from departments. Um, so this text struck through in red represents initial changes recommended first to the action about police presence uh, for public spaces 1.3 if this language was to uh, be included in the final document. The only modification to that text shown here uh, is the removal of the word fully from the first line. Um, and again, uh, this is a, a, a reminder for some, but that's because during the longer term life of this plan, the appropriate level of staffing may fluctuate depending on the environment and the needs of the police department and city. The city could maintain some flexibility by not defining the current staffing level as a desired standard. So that's the first of the, of the two new actions the plan commission recommended. The other new action item um, was for well-organized 1.5. That would be to monitor housing and shelter for low income residents. Um, and uh, residents who are experiencing homelessness downtown, or uh, it's not specific, but uh, would be included in the downtown plan. So uh, again, the remainder of the text uh, cites the comprehensive plan uh, value to uh, established in the comprehensive plan for encouraging housing to low income and homeless throughout the entire city. And implementing that downtown, the city and downtown Spokane partnership should coordinate with the public and private agencies uh, to evaluate existing needs, facilities, and programs relative to health and human services. Um, again, uh, as with the first action, initial city department feedback uh, is shown here in red. This time it's underlined. This would be to include a statement about bringing the work the city and downtown Spokane partnership did to coordinate uh, this, um, to coordinate with the different agencies back to the continuum of care board uh, which is the regionally authorized body. And that additional text, again, if the council includes the plan commission's recommended text, would uh, help give this work a focus and recognize the empowered regional entity to coordinate the city's response to the unhoused. So I just wanted to focus on those two modifications the plan commission made um, as just additional text and then um, the city's uh, initial response to that text as, uh, as promised to the plan commission. There's that initial department recommended revision. So for next steps, uh, first I mentioned potential council revisions coming forward for consideration in a resolution at the meeting on June 28th with advanced agenda briefing for that meeting occurring for the council at its briefing session next week. And I'll mention there's 11 items in the draft resolution relating to changes the council members have discussed for the plan. And then uh, there's a public hearing expected next month and uh, following that, there's a mayor's signature, and uh, for 30 days, it goes into um, effect. And this all will be posted as, uh, as there are new updates on the project webpage. Again, it's shown at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I'm available for any questions. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, uh, Nate, thanks for uh, for being here this afternoon. I guess I was really hoping 
you would be presenting some findings of fact or, or just input on those 11 items. You know, we had a pretty broad discussion on those at our last study session, and I would just love to hear from you or the administration in terms of vetting on those and, and what, what, the, uh, what the input might be. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll take that back. I, I know that those are, uh, you know, sponsored by the council members. And so uh, we're still, um, uh, you know, collecting um, feedback from internal departments and um, should have some more feedback for you um, in the, the next few weeks. But again, uh, this process is going to roll out over the next couple of months. So um, we should have some, um, some better updates for you later. Okay. And we have, when we have those updates, we're happy to get them on this agenda for this um, committee. So remember that. Thank you. So, President Pro Tem Mun. I hope my mic is working. Thank you. Uh, Nate, can we you can go? I hear you. Oh. Still learning the new technology. Nate, could you go back to the map? I just had a question about the broken line to the east. Is that including a new area in the downtown plan, expanding it? And the reason I bring it up is because in the past when we've passed the downtown plan, we've really drilled down specifically um, to look at all areas because they are different. The North Bank's different. Um, but this area too, has it had enough study or any specialized planning for that area by including it? Yeah, thank you. The, the planning area, you can see this at the bottom. Um, the planning area is a solid boundary and then the proposed expansion is a uh, dashed line um, in the legend here. And that would extend uh, eastward to cover the, the entire area that was covered by the South University District sub area plan. Um, and there was some, there were some land use changes along Sprague to um, from general commercial to downtown land use. And so this, by extending the downtown boundary, uh, we're really grabbing the the entire South University District. Um, it does uh, it does uh, align with the uh, Hamilton Interchange, and so there is a kind of a natural barrier or uh, man-made barrier. But um, that's a that's kind of a natural boundary, uh, a natural edge. And um, then there's uh, just a few blocks east of South Scott Street that are included in that um, that area. Thank you, because I'm thinking also along the riverbank, I think there's a big development planned for that area. And I just wanna make sure that there's coordination because we're adding this area in, just calling that out because that's that's a huge bite. Correct, there, north of the, um, yeah, north of the tracks. And I'm actually not sure that any of that area is included. This map um, is showing it along the river, but it wasn't, I'm not sure any, any area north of the tracks is included in the South University District sub-area plan. So that development um, that's underneath the Hamilton, Hamilton Street Bridge might be, um, it might be all excluded from this um, plan boundary. So do we need to fix the map? Maybe? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's a good pitch. Thank you. Who else has questions? Member Wilkerson. So, Nate, does this boundary on the South University District butt up to the ESBA uh, lines of their area? Or is there like a gap between the U District, several blocks, and you have the East Bragg Business District? Do you follow me, my thinking on that? Yeah, I, I follow your thinking. I'm not totally sure about where those boundaries fall, but um, I. I don't think there is a break between um, the East Sprague. Well, there, there may be a few blocks of, of break between the University District's boundary and, and the uh, East, East, uh, or East Sprague bid, but um, I can definitely look into that and let you know. That'd be great because uh, whoever those businesses or people are, if you're caught kind of between two pretty significant entities, what would they do if they wanted to do something different? So what would be their representation? How would that change their land use uh, in that space down there? Yeah, that's a good question. 
thousand is a cap card. Nate, so if we carve that out, uh, what what happens? Uh, what what would not? I guess what would not happen in that area that, that we expect to happen with this plan? So you're talking about the the area that's encompassed by the development, the district that's north of the tracks. Yeah, um, it's it, it wouldn't have any impact. It's uh, there's no land use changes proposed there. Um, there were no, uh, as I say, I think the South University. University District Plan didn't include that area, so um, there was uh, there were no changes there. It's just a it's just a technical error on this particular map. Um, so that that development would continue to um, be uh, continue to be part of the University District, um, just not part of the downtown planning area in the South University District. Do we do we know how the the PDA feels? Would they want to be to have that included in the downtown plan? I'm I, I I I'm not sure. Um, I, I haven't. I don't believe we've received any input from uh, the PDA on the boundary in particular. But um, this, as part of this effort, we were um, cognizant, especially the South University District sub area plan effort, and trying to align that particular sub area plan and this sub area boundary. So, so Karen, I know Mark Richards is on the call. In their outreach, does he have any information that could help us with that question? Mark, feel free to, to uh, weigh in if you'd like. Thank you, uh, council members. Um, I just happen to be standing next to uh, Andrew, so I'm just gonna punt and ask Andrew, do you know if there's any outreach that's been done to the university district or the PDA regarding the expanded proposed boundary for the downtown? Although the director is certainly aware of the process um, and um, plan is included input or for content from that. It's informed by, in part, it's informed the content here. Um, and and Nate's, Nate's aware of that as well. Um, but and I'd have to dig, dig into that to get, to get a final answer. So it sounds like there's been some sharing of information back and forth but probably shared Nate's uncertainty about to what extent. Yeah, I think the, you know, the um, director was involved with the steering committee. Um, there, that area has recently been, uh, you know, uh, the road has recently been built there, uh, the street for Martin Luther King uh, Way. And I'm not sure there's much that's coming on the planning horizon in that area in terms of the city's um, involvement, but um, it, it could be included uh, in a future update, perhaps, or uh, we, we can, you know, definitely circle back and find out where those exactly where those boundaries fall so that we can uh, look at that more closely if you'd like. I think I'm seeing heads shake yes on on that one, Nate. Anybody else have questions, comments? I can't see everybody, so just yell if you have a question. Now I see more people. Anybody else? So it looks like we're gonna, we'll probably do this a couple more times, get some updates from Nathan. So if you have questions, concerns, I would send him a email so he'll know what to uh, include in his next presentation. Will that work, Nate? That will work great, thanks very much. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate all your hard work on this. Thanks. Okay, looking at the agenda, we have moved the um, Housing Action Subcommittee stipend discussion. That's gonna be moved to the Finance Committee. So I'm going to invite Mark Richard and Kevin Campbell and DSP for an update on the bid. And they have about 10, 15 minutes. So again, if you have questions, conversations that you want to have, please ask them. Take it away, Mark. Thank you, uh, Council Member Stratton, very much for the opportunity for our uh, quarterly update and do welcome the questions and feedback, obviously. Uh, so we'll just, uh, um, this is our report out to you in our management of the Business Improvement District, the downtown bid. And so Kevin, if you could switch to the next slide. So I'm just gonna go through this fairly quickly. Uh, first of all, with the retirement of our clean team supervisor, we just had who has done a remarkable job of really turning our clean team around, Karen Fritz. Uh, we have made the conscious decision to hire a new director that will oversee 
uh, both clean and safe uh, at this point. And um, that individual starts on the 21st. And we're really excited about his ability to help us come in and help take us forward in terms of our strategy, our strategic planning, and our expansion of the business improvement district, all the things that the council, uh, you know, has requested of us and more. So uh, he will start on the 21st. Um, we also have been uh, posting, we, we like you and most everybody else, we continue to struggle with uh, finding folks that are interested in employment. And um, as we talked about in another setting, we have just increased our starting wage to $16 an hour. Um, and most of our positions now offer full benefits, including a, a, a matching IRA or 401k type uh, retirement vehicle. And we're posting our, our advertising in a little bit broader scope. So in, it, uh, in looking at different ways, platforms to advertise these positions, including most recently uh, HVPA's newsletter, as well as um, the Black Lens. And uh, just would welcome, if you guys uh, think of areas where we can promote and advertise any of our positions, we welcome that. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, not sure Liz uh, put this graphic here, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, reporting out that we just completed our audit, our independent audit with Shadle and Shadle, and uh, we received uh, yet again a clean audit uh, from that firm. Uh, that final report uh, will be delivered to council on or before June 30th, um, as it is every year. And so, again, welcome any questions that you have or if you'd like a deeper dive on that. Uh, we also, the, the bid exec committee uh, before oh, just um, nominated and was um, selected, I think, up for your approval, and that's Tim O'Doherty from O'Doherty's Irish Pub to serve on the parking advisory committee. And then we, uh, we also have one seat that remains open uh, since, of course, Lars has secured employment outside the downtown area, he was another appointee uh, that you all were um, going to either did or were going to take action on. And then lastly, on this slide, um, we are about two-thirds of the way through our contract work with Dr. Sherry Clark uh, for our board and our entire staff on some DEI training. And also, she'll be conducting a cultural audit for us, which um, I'm probably most excited about, and that's really looking at our website and our language and our applications and, and the internal stuff to make sure that we are in fact walking the talk as far as being open and accessible and inviting uh, to uh, folks from all backgrounds. And so we're excited to see that work uh, begin. Okay, next slide. So uh, we have uh, completed our um, railroad viaduct uh, cleaning for uh, this month. So we're cleaning on a regular basis uh, we're doing power washing uh, through underneath the railroad viaducts, even though they're not technically in the bid, they certainly have a profound impact on the bid. So Madison, Lincoln, Jefferson, Monroe, Wall Street, Adams, and Howard are primarily the ones that we are power washing. And then we also are uh, driving through those, as you probably recall, on a three times a week basis to do sterilization, just to do what we can to make sure that that area is safe uh, for the folks that are houseless and find themselves in these Viaducts. Our volunteer crews also participated in Spring Clean Week, uh, the week of April 19th, and we had volunteers from GSI, Columbia Bank, and City Administration that joined us this year, and so I want to give a, a big thanks to them. Next slide. Uh, we completed our spring planting throughout downtown, you might have noticed. Um, this year, unfortunately, we've got some of our plants that are lagging a little bit behind, uh, so we'll need to have a little bit of patience, uh, no pun intended for those. Um, but uh, we planted nearly 200 sidewalk planters. And again, for that exercise, we had volunteers from Exit Realty and Kaufman Engineering. And then we also have uh, coordinated and planned the plants on Spokane Falls with the Spokane Community College's Landscape Construction Program and Greenhouse, which we have done every year for a handful of years now. And that's just an awesome partnership with them. And lastly, on this slide, we've just geared up uh, our, our second pickup truck with another watering tank and pump. So we're going to add more frequent cleaning uh, of not only our viaducts, but also the big belly on um, garbage cans and for uh, more swift removal of graffiti. Next slide, please. Uh, we continue to coordinate with your code enforcement staff, as well as the police department and Geiger uh, work crews, where we are cleaning, like I say, the all 14 viaducts uh, three times a week. And uh, so that keeps us busy, and hopefully that uh, folks find that beneficial. Next slide, please. 
Uh, one of the things that we did this uh, last uh, quarter was we partnered up with some property managers because we became aware that there were some challenges being experienced in some of the Skywalk network with regards to behavior. And so we met with some of those individuals, provided them SEPTED information, uh, the, the crime prevention through environmental design program that you all support us with, and um, had some almost immediate success in terms of reducing some loitering and negative activity. But also out of that, um, we're, we're now going to be engaging with those property managers in looking at more permanent SEPTED improvements as well as wayfinding, uh, something that uh, probably have been on all of our minds, but how can we use this moment and collaboration to, to take this to the next level and try to make sure that folks on the ground level, different parts of our community, maybe at the bus station, they know what businesses are down, uh, you know, down that uh, corridor and, and uh, give them a reason to essentially to migrate through those and use the Skywalk network and to support our second floor businesses. Uh, so we're anxious to get started on that. Next slide, please. The ambassadors uh, just report out to you that they're um, noticing, as we probably are in our walks, we're, we're starting to see some tourists coming back to Spokane and some parents uh, with their kids during, during uh, for some of those that are on summer break that are using their downtown. Uh, we're getting more hospitality related questions and uh, and that, which is also uh, very encouraging and exciting as we're seeing restaurants and uh, stores begin to fill back up. Um, the ambassador team uh, also recently met with the director for Volunteers America new youth, um, ad young adult shelter. And uh, after about an hour and a half kind of an introduction with that individual, literally within the next week, we were able to refer and our team literally took the time to walk up and walk a young adult up to that shelter and uh, actually bought him dinner and uh, tried to help facilitate him getting the help that he needed at the new shelter. And so uh, we love those partnerships. And again, just welcome those if you're thinking of an agency that maybe we should or could be connected with in addition to those that we've shared with you. Um, on the next slide, our ambassadors conducted a walk along with a a few of you uh, in preparation for our contract discussions. And uh, so uh, we're really grateful for the time that you were willing to take out to really uh, dive in and understand what it is our team does, how they do it, and then, and then provide um, really excellent feedback as we're going through this discussion. And I would say ongoing. Uh, we welcome this anytime. If you want to do a walk along with our clean team or the ambassadors, this is an open invitation to council. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have just, uh, Elizabeth and Kevin have just launched uh, uh, here this spring, Spokane is Downtown campaign. Uh, and uh, so they're highlighting a number of different businesses in the downtown area through social media, and it'll be followed up by print as well as uh, digital ads. Uh, just going to read a handful of the ones that we've done so far that are pretty fun. Art Jacobs, uh, Intertribal Beauty, Decorum, Chicken and Mo. Uh, Bistangos, Martini Lounge, uh, Savvy Homes, and uh, Soulful Soups, as well as Yuppie Puppy uh, was a fun one for us. And uh, so we're just um, doing what we can, obviously, to help promote those businesses and make sure that the public uh, understands just the gems that we have. Most of them locally owned, small, you know, operations, local entrepreneurs uh, living out their dream. And so that's been fun. Um, and finally, on that page, just we, we are, our team is strategizing on a reunion campaign. Uh, so we have kind of thought this through in terms of how do, we, how do we encourage our businesses to consider and employees coming back to work uh, while being sensitive to all of their safety interests and their other concerns. So we're going to be doing uh, kind of a return to work program uh, dubbed as a reunion, uh, coming back to, to see your old business that you used to uh, visit, uh, join your uh, colleagues for coffee, those kinds of things. And they'll be in partnership with several small business related events, including our second annual uh, summer sidewalk sale that'll happen in uh, late July. Next slide. Um, the Kids Spring Scramble was another success. That's a collaboration with Riverfront Park and River Park Square. Uh, we are currently strategizing for what we're dubbing Kids City which will be a downtown wide kids club as uh, intended to incentivize kids 14 and younger to explore downtown Spokane. 
And then uh, we've, we've executed contracts for our lighting and our bander, banner installation contractors for uh, through 2024, just recently. And then we've got plans in the works for, as you, uh, you council is aware of, in terms of activation proposals that we're working on currently with the Parkgate Plaza, as well as uh, beginning discussions with property owners and what we're dubbing kind of the South Main Alley. So this alley stretch between Washington, essentially, and potentially Lincoln, uh, we think we've got a fun little network of alleyways that we could connect through and really create some some fun uh, experience and really to launch off of what uh, Councilwoman Kinnear assisted us with a couple of years back before that alley was closed down between Wall and Howard um, and between Riverside and Maine. So you're going to see the return of Live After Five concert series that we used to host. And then uh, Council also received a proposal from our marketing team for programming for the Place of Truth Plaza um, behind the library overlooking the falls. Next slide, please. So we're planning on uh, commencing some of our events on Wall Street here um, this, month, uh, this month, I believe maybe first part of July, uh, our Sunday Art Mart, our Kids Saturdays, Junior Fire Academy, and Fall Fest. Unfortunately, the food truck uh, Fridays, the, the Food Truck Association, because of the uncertainty with programming and allowed events in the city, uh, they have temporarily moved their uh, Food Truck Friday event that we helped them to create uh, a couple of years back. They've moved that out to the Valley, but um, we're going to do everything we can to get that back for you in 2022. And then we're partnering with Spokane Arts for some painted murals on the Lincoln Post Alley, as I mentioned, and then on the Lincoln Building, uh, and then led by artist Tiffany Patterson. And um, then artist Joshua Thomas, we've just contracted in partnership with Republic Services to commission uh, some murals that he's working on on the old car electric building. So instead of leaving those blank windows or boarded up windows, um, we're gonna see a really fun, whimsical, um, you know, kind of a mural on that stretch. Next slide, please. Two events that are being proposed for downtown that we're in discussions with, uh, with the HBPA, the Hispanic Professional Business Association or Business Professional Association. They're working on this idea of, um, tacos and tequila uh, for the week uh, weekend of August 29th and 30th, and we're in early discussions with them over that. And then an uh, 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 organizer that we've uh, held events in downtown with for probably eight years at least is the Festival of Speed is planning for this year is what's called Oktoberfest. Uh, so it'll be a, a fun event in combination with some of the historic nostalgic race cars that you used to in the fall that come down every year and then also with a beer festival and then lastly first friday we're giving it a little bit of a refresher and a and a new look that will include it uh a new passport that will encourage folks to get around to different shops and to support different businesses and then uh, lastly of course um, we just recently completed a series of three pop-up um, vaccine clinics where we i think we vaccinated a, just short of 200 individuals through those three events. So uh, very thankful for our partnership with the Health District and um, National Guard and, and others. Next slide. So applications are now being accepted for our cultural grant, uh, event grant that we just launched this year. Uh, that'll be $25,000 we've made available for new cultural events to be held in downtown, up to $5,000 uh, per applicant. And we're partnering with Spokane Arts who's gonna help us through the um, awards process on that. And the, uh, the award recipients will be announced the third week of July. Uh, staff is also collaborating with Visit Spokane as they are looking to really take a, a regional look at how we, how we showcase in the holiday season this winter. Uh, we're weaving in and probably will enhance the work that we've been doing to celebrate and to honor the holiday season in downtown Spokane. Next slide, please. Just got like two more slides left. So I uh, just wanted to let you know, uh, per our contract, one of the things that we do on an annual basis is we, we gather and report out data to our property managers and to our real estate brokers. That's one of the things that we're charged to do is make sure that we have current staffs and we're helping them uh, to be able to essentially attract and retain businesses in downtown. Uh, this year's magazine is focused much on that uh, um, kind of focus this year, which is new for us. So it's really our intention is to be a bit of a toolkit that folks can use, including our brokers, to be able to share with prospective customers. 
And then lastly, a customer service card uh, that we have just completed uh, where our clean and our safe teams will now be packing those on them. This is in response to some of the thoughts you brought up during our contract discussions where um, they can they will provide these postcards to the customers they interact with and ask for their direct feedback to our website. Um, next slide, please. So we are, uh, we are launching our e-news that goes out to our business improvement district ratepayers to 1,200 downtown businesses. And then we are also refreshing what we, something we created shortly after I got here and I stole from the real estate industry is a kind of a welcome packet. If you've ever bought a new home, you've gotten a welcome packet. We started creating this in downtown about four years ago or so, maybe five, where we're now delivering them a box of goodies and information about their downtown as a business opens up. And so a few new businesses that we're tracking and that we're, that we're grateful that are, have located downtown, People's Waffle, Top Drawer Media, Stella's Cafe, Tava Latte, and Bosco Pasta and Panini. And then, of course, uh, you all helped us in a ribbon cutting for People's Waffle and Cosmic Cowboy. And we have an upcoming grand reopening for Evans Brothers Coffee. Next slide. Uh, just really briefly, this is one program we just started uh, in the fall of last year as a means to connect our customers with salient information and do the best we can to put that information in their hands and to uh, make sure that we're just providing opportunities for folks to be successful. This 30 minutes with is intended to do a quick, brief connection with uh, local topics of interest as well as experts and some recent ones that we've done are with uh, Cupid Alexander out of your CHHS department, uh, Chris Syme, who's uh, in our ambassador team who did a SEPTED training, and we had Marlene Feist to help uh, communicate out on our snow plan, and then Edie Reisauer with transitions to give you a couple of examples. And then finally, uh, we are, as again, for the discussions on our contract, uh, we are developing a ratepayer satisfaction survey that will be disseminated out uh, in the fall. Uh, as you've requested, and of course, that information will be channeled to the council as well as to us so that we can continue to monitor and enhance our performance. And with that, I would just close and welcome any questions. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. I just have two, Mark. So on that viaduct cleanup program, the administration just uh, announced they were going to partner with uh, BID DSP. So are you looking at more employees to partner on your end of the deal? That's my one question. And then second, uh, the cultural grants, I acknowledge the $25,000 amazing in what's going out. I'm a little concerned you did not mention, it may have been an oversight, Unity in the Community, which has been here for a significant amount of time that cuts across all the cultures. So um, I just want to make sure that's on your radar. And $5,000 is a lot of money. But for all the organizations they partner with, y'all might want to look at stepping up your game this year uh, to make that happen since there was no unity in the community last year. Mm -hmm. um, this weekend, I was out in the valley at the AAPI Heritage event, and it was amazing. So I know that we could lean in as businesses downtown to make this the premier event that it was and to restore us to its glory. So help about the cleanup administration partnership. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about that because that's really just working its way through uh, the seventh floor and then that commitment to unity in the community. I look forward to all that. Thanks, Mark. Excellent. Great comments and questions. So. First of all, I've uh, been in a couple of meetings now with your new city administrator, uh, Johnny Perkins, and we're definitely communicating closely on the clean uh, efforts and, and share that passion, as I'm sure you do, is making sure that our, our downtown as well as our whole city is beautiful and clean. Um, I think the initial plan is, as I understand it, is, um, is so we, we currently have two openings in our clean team. We'd certainly love to fill those. Uh, we, we anticipate, and, and you have in front of you a plan to add to those teams incrementally as we look to grow the, the business improvement district boundary to the south. Um, and I think in the interim uh, is what I understand is that some of those new hires for code enforcement will support and partner and work with us, just like code enforcement currently does. 
uh, some of that work of theirs being in downtown and perhaps being in that south area until we can get into that area, you know, with the services we provide. And then at that time, I think what he's anticipating is that'll free his team up to be able to just further disperse throughout the entire city. So you're so that the whole community is seeing the benefits of this expanded kind of beautification and clean team effort. Uh, with regards to unity in the community, I just uh, um, uh, have to say, I, I just personally, uh, I take a little bit of pride in the fact that uh, when I came in as a freshman county commissioner, I was approached by uh, Ben Cabildo. This would have been in 2005. The county had never acknowledged, let alone for funded uh, unity in the community. Um, and every year that I was in office from the time that he and I met, uh, the county was a significant contributor to the unity in the community event. And uh, we were because of exactly what you say is that, um, number one, we think it's a beautiful place for unity in the community to be. And I know there was some controversy initially about whether that should have been in the East Bragg uh, community. However, what, what this has done is it's been able to attract, you know, hundreds if not thousands of folks to be able to celebrate all kinds of different backgrounds and cultures in our most beautiful prized, you know, Jewel Park. And, uh, and so, yes, uh, you know, if, uh, if they certainly would be eligible um, to apply, um, but uh, I will take it upon myself to reach out directly to Ben and make sure that they know that they can apply and do whatever I can to help facilitate. We, we, we also, of course, encourage and have had them on our community calendar, um, but I will work directly with Ben to see what else we can do to support their efforts because uh, we want them around for a long time to, uh, to come. Mm -hmm. I just say that because other communities would love to have unity in the community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just like other great events, um, people are taking notice. And so we want to keep our jewels downtown. And that's why I just mentioned that to you. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for the suggestion. Any other questions for Mark or comments? Mark, I just have a, a quick one and it's, regarding the sanitation activities under the viaducts that take yeah. So can you just explain, let's just take one, from beginning of cleanup to end, how long does that take and what's involved in that? Hmm. Well, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it kind of depends. Um, uh, there are times when, um, when we have uh, when we're well coordinated with law enforcement and we arrive together and we're working closely with um, the Geiger crew, uh, where, um, you know, essentially uh, law enforcement will encourage folks to uh, please step up and out of the viaduct and to move your things uh, that would allow us to do the proper cleaning. That, of course, takes more time. Um, and, and then um, the Geiger crew would come through and remove anything left behind. And then we would assist them in that. And then we would come through with our, the gator that you acquired for us, where we apply a sterilant in the tank and it allows us to sterilize to really just make sure that the folks that, uh, again, find themselves living in these underpasses uh, the best that we possibly can. We're trying to make say, a safe environment uh, for them. That, that, can take, um, that can take a few hours, uh, frankly, if, we're, if we go through that entire process. On some of these viaducts, that the coordination isn't always um, as in depth, and so it might be just like our our team on a daily basis going up into the viaduct and essentially talking with the folks that are under the viaduct. Uh, and we, and we, you know, oftentimes we work around them. We don't ask them to move. Uh, we just come through and we clean. Um, but it makes it makes, of course, that use of the sterilization agent to, more difficult. Um, we can't we can't do that unless they're willing to you know, to step up and out. In, in that case, it might take us closer to, you know, a half an hour or an hour tops per viaduct. It kind of depends on to what extent we're going at it, to what extent we get the cooperation, and therefore to what extent we're going to do the cleaning, if that makes any sense. Thank you for that. I, I, you bet. I know I was one that didn't really think about how much work that actually was, and I hear about it. And of course, we have citizens that will contact our offices about it as well. But thank you for explaining that because I, I, I needed to hear, you know, what was involved and how much effort. And, and thank you for those services. 
Well, um, I, I wish I could take the credit. It's really my team, uh, obviously, that does that um, difficult work, and I will pass that on to them. Um, I, I will say that is also, uh, as I mentioned, BNSF is not inside the Business Improvement District, but it is adjacent to it. Um, Burlington Northern is a member of ours. They have joined at a significant level as a, as a means of essentially providing us some financial support to do that cleaning. Uh, and then and then with your cooperation and partnership, we were able to acquire the equipment. And we partner with, as I mentioned, the teams that we partner with. And so it's it's a it's a part it's a group effort and it takes many hands. Um, the, the, unfortunately the public doesn't realize this at times, um, Councilwoman, is uh, we can go in, especially if folks aren't willing to move, we'll go in and clean up litter, garbage, you know, um, other stuff, and, uh, and and we can leave, and within an hour, it doesn't look like we've been there at all, and I think sometimes that's frustrating to the public, uh, but we're just doing the best we can within the conditions we have uh, and, and trying to work with individuals that are in those underpasses, uh, you know, in a respectful way. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Any other questions for Mark? Okay, Mark, thank you. Thank you all so much. Appreciate well, I'm it. Glad you were able to join us and we got that worked out. Me too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, finally, we're going to go to Chris Becker and she's going to do the building permit and construction update. There is her shining face. Chris, <laughs> turn it over to you. All right. I. I'm going to try to find my um, presentation. It's not showing up, <laughs> which is very strange. Oh, do you see that PowerPoint now? Okay, great. We see it. All right, awesome. So um, we continue to be busy um, in the Development Services Center. Our total permit activity is still up about 17%. We're up from 2019 by 5%. That's the, the total number of permits, including um, trade permits, building permits, everything. Um, single family residences, uh, we continue to be very busy there. They're up 153% from last year and up 47% from 2019. Um, we've issued 195 permits. Uh, so far this year, and our valuations also continue to be up, up about 32%. Um, and then I'll just direct you uh, down to the graph along the bottom. You can see we are continue to see um, an increase in the number of permits that people are applying for online, which is just awesome. We've been able to make some um, significant improvements to our um, permitting our Acela Citizen Access System um, during COVID. Uh, things we wanted to do anyway, but were accelerated due to the pandemic. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, all of our residential permits can be done through electronic document review, so a paperless process. And we are um, in the process of uh, implementing that for commercial permits as well. So um, here are the uh, total valuations. We are at $305 million through the first five months of the year which is a lot. <laughs> um, the, this shows the breakdown, the size of, of the permits. Um, so we've had three pretty big projects come through, totaling the 137 million. Um, those are projects greater than 10 million. That was two schools. Um, and uh, it's escaping me, but we're gonna see it on a later slide and I'll point it out then. <laughs> Uh, and then um, we see really healthy um, $120, sorry, $121 million in projects less than $1 million. So a pretty good split there. Uh, this is the uh, breakout of public funded projects in the orange versus privately funded. And we're seeing um, a very healthy investment from, our, from the private side. Um, the $96 million is the two schools that we've issued permits for and um, some of the central city line work. Um, this is the uh, single family permit. So like I said, we've issued 195 um, so far this year. Um, and that is up from 158 last month. 
Um, I went and I checked last week to see how many were still in plan review. We had about 48 in plan review. Remember, we had 200 submitted just ahead of the code change earlier this year. Um, and in my Monday morning reports this morning, we've issued permits for 35 just last week. Um, and so we're, we're working through that big backlog of single family homes, which is um, awesome to get through that. Um, but we're continuing to see more permits come in. So we're, we're getting between 10 and 20 uh, new permits every month for single family homes. So, that, so that's good. Um, and then I have new things to show you this month. Chris, oh, yeah. I was just going to ask you, Chris, if you had a map of where those permits were being. <laughs> and mind reader, thank you. I do, just for you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so um, this is a, a new map, and I'm going to send you the um, Power BI so that you can click on the points and kind of see what they are. Um, Power BI is not great for mapping. Um, so we're going to, so any feedback you have on this, I know it's hard to see the points are very small, the colors are, there's a lot of colors there. Um, but this is the location of all the single family permits that have been issued in 2020 and 2021. And the colors represent the valuation. So not, not necessarily the, the price that those homes were sold, but the valuation that was associated with that building permit. Um, and so you can kind of, it allows you to see a, where, where we're issuing permits um, and be uh, kind of the, the distribution of um, based on valuation. So um, I think, you know, it'll be easier to see when it's on your computer screen and you can kind of click around. Um, but that you can see this is only for single family. So there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the number of permits and the number of housing units over here. I, oh, yeah. Chris, I, I hope others are just as curious as I am. What's that blue dot right in the middle of the K of Spokane? Um, it is probably a uh, permit that the address did not um, plot correctly. Um, so it'll, it will probably, when we, um, sometimes when our addressing GIS layer is not up to date as we're issuing new addresses for like a new plot or something, um, and so it's just a misplotted point. But when you get the Power BI report, you will be able to hover over that and it will tell you the actual address of that permit. I also have this for other housing units. Um, so this, this is, you'll see this is not a one-to-one -one correlation. We've, in, uh, we've issued 23 permits uh, for 750 housing units. Uh, so this is showing you duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, um, mixed use, um, apartments, um, anything that is not a single family permit. Um, and so this is the colors are only showing you the valuation of the permits. And I think what we would like to add maybe for next month is to show you the type of housing. Um, I think this one is also showing manufactured homes and ADUs as well. Um, so I'll have that as well so that you can see the valuation and then maybe the type where, where um, you know, where we're seeing apartments, where we're seeing duplexes, where we're seeing ADUs added. Yes. Hi, Chris. Chris uh, oh, go ahead, Council Member Cathcart. Oh, sorry. I just, do you have average permit times uh, available? Um, not off the top of my head. Um, I will tell you commercial permits, we're still um, running about five weeks to get comments, first comments, but we are working very diligently to bring that down. Um, on single family, we are still utilizing the third party reviewer, but I think we are kind of reaching the tail end of that big, that big surge in workload. So I would expect those numbers to come down as well. Okay, because I've, I've heard some frustrations from folks that, that the times are getting longer and longer. So They're not getting longer. Um, they've been at that four to six, six week time frame for a while. But um, I think we saw, like I said, we, we saw that huge increase in, in workload in, at the end of January, and we're finally getting to the end of that. And so I think you will see some improvement. You will. You will see some improvement. Hey, Chris. 
a lot yep. about Evelyn. Just a quick question. So what is the, um, I know that it's, it's taking longer for the permitting process, but what is the optimal time? What is the, the time frame that, that is, is the most um, efficient and um, works better? So when we, def when we defined our, um, our future state, when we did our continuous improvement project 10 years ago now, um, our goal was to be able to process a full route permit, so like a new commercial building in 30 days. And what that looked like was um, an application came in, we did a completeness check, we had 14 days to do a complete review. We gave the applicant comments 14 days later, then they had seven days to make the corrections. They turned it back in on day 21. We reviewed, um, we had seven days to uh, review their revisions and it should be you know, one set of revisions and we're done. Um, and then we would be able to issue the permit in under 30 days. That's our goal. But a, a, sing, a single family home should take less time than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Candace, a question? Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, thank you for these maps because I think what it shows is how uh, it is distributed across all of our districts. And the having the valuation here is really critical because we've talked a lot about the middle missing middle housing. And I'm seeing, at least in the single family, we're hitting that target. In fact, most of the uh, permits are in that, that zone. So that's helpful for us because I think we want to have those metrics to try to have, you know, targeted areas. I also think it's great that you're, you're counting the number of units because what you're telling us today is in five months, we've put through 950 new units and our target on our housing action plan is about 450 units a year over the next 10 years, I think, or 15 years. So this is great information and it may not be able to keep up at this pace, but um, thank you because I think we can talk specifics and numbers and instead of fear and worry. And, and really, I think your office is doing an incredible job processing th the things as quickly as you are because uh, for me, the delays are not with government, they're with getting the um, equipment, the labor, and the, the materials that we need on a timely basis. So I think it's gonna take maybe a little longer to get these built, but at least in the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let me, sorry. So this is the multifamily um, that we've permitted, 183 um, have been issued so far this year. And I checked last week and we have another 354 um, in review. So I, I, I do wanna point out the map was for 2020 and 2021 together. So that's why the numbers are higher than what I'm showing you in these bar graphs. Um, so we do just have a lot of units in review um, and issued so far this year. It's only, you know, only the first five months. Um, so this map is showing the largest projects issued um, in 2021. The new ones on here are, um, I have to refresh my memory, the uh, Northeast Middle School at 42 million um, and the Spokane International Academy at 3.7 million. All of the others um, were on the map last month. Uh, these are the largest projects in plan review. These are all the same and this is another mapping error. The McKinstry Warehouse is plotting here for some reason instead of out on the, the West Plains where it is. Um, Again, I think that's just our GIS layer for addressing uh, hasn't been updated. And then these are the largest projects coming through our pre-development. Um, and we had two new ones here as well. Um, the SAC Middle School replacement came through at $49 million. And then this one is the NODO loss, which is right across the street from the 55 West Mission um, way out shelter project. Um, so that I think was in pre -dev, I think last week um, at 18 million and 168 units. I think that is my last slide. Yes, it is. 
Does anybody have additional questions or comments for Chris? Councilmember Kinnear. Chris, thank you. Um, you have a way of putting everything into perspective. I really appreciate that. And it's easy to understand and to digest. So thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? No questions, no comments? You're going to let her off this easy? Okay. Oh, okay. Council Member Wilkerson. I just need clarity. When you say 183 permits in multifamily housing, I think I missed the connection of those are permits, but that equals to how many units or a guesstimation of how many I misspoke. Units? It's units, the 183 units. Multifamily units. units have been permitted this okay. year. Okay, okay, units, okay. Thank you. And how many did you say 300 and some coming up that are? 354 in plan review right now. Perfect. Okay, anybody else? All right, Chris, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you can get on with your day. And we just have one more under consent items. Did anybody have anything under consent items that they have questions or want to discuss? Nothing? Okay, perfect. So this meeting, we are done. So you have a little bit of time before our 3.30. Um, enjoy it while you can, and we will see you all again very, very soon. Thanks. Meeting adjourned. Next meeting is July 12th.